looks like got most people in from the waiting room, but I think we should probably go ahead and get get started on time. Uh, my name is Bill Stanley, I'm the Associate Provost uh, for Faculty Success. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the October edition of Lightning Lounge. Thanks for coming. Um, I want to give thanks to uh, Julia Fulgham, Kate Cunningham, and Sandy Rodriguez from the Advance at UNM, as well as Mary Jo Daniel and Monica Official at the Office of Vice President for, for Research for all the hard work, hard work organizing. Uh, this is very much a collective effort. Um, as usual for a lightning lounge, we're, we'll have four presenters um, and each will speak for seven minutes. Um, uh, I have a little time sheets that I'll hold up to the camera uh, so that you can see when it's time to, uh, time, time to stop. Um, so if you can just keep a gallery view on the sidebar so you can see, uh, see me and I'll give you time prompts if you need them. Um, we'll take some questions after each uh, presentation uh, and it's probably easiest if you just raise your hand in the participants list. Um, uh, <clears throat> since we won't be able to, when, when we stop sharing the screen, we won't be able to see all of you probably across two screens with uh, 45 people right now. Um, so if you raise your hands that way, that would be fine. But also if there's a clear pause, go ahead and feel free to jump in uh, and say, uh, 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 you know, ask, ask your question. Um, Let's see, we will go in the order at which people have appeared on the, uh, uh, on the poster. So we'll be starting with uh, Sang Han, who's a professor in chemical and biological engineering, as well as electrical and computer engineering. And the topic of his course on your screen is looking for Gumby in days of climate change. So Professor Han. Thank you. Um, and thanks for the opportunity for this uh, afternoon talk to share some of the things that we do in, our, uh, in my research group. So um, as we are uh, keenly aware, the climate change really caused us to think about how we can achieve decarbonization. And that is to minimize the amount of carbon that we produce and emit into the atmosphere. So one of the solutions, one of many, is to use, harness the solar energy. And um, I'm sure many of you have seen utility scale solar farms that surround us, especially if you're traveling northbound on I-25, you can definitely see a couple of uh, solar farms along the way. But here's a problem. So, uh, by the way, before I get into details, I just wanted to orient you with what we mean by solar panels and solar cells that are in that panel. So you can see a single panel that's about 1.3 square meters. And each square block that you're seeing is a silicon cell and if magnified view looks like this. Blue represents the silicon substrate and white grid lines represent what I call metallization. So that is the metal fingers that harness electricity, useful electricity. So solar energy gets absorbed by the solar cell, the silicon produces electricity, and then we collect them by um, essentially touching them or making a contact with a solar cell with uh, silver metal. But it turns out that these solar cells actually crack over time, whether it is during manufacturing, uh, certainly during shipping and installation. They even call it German testing, installation testing, where the installers will jump up and down on, the, uh, on these panels to make sure that they are installed correctly, but it turns out to be a really bad thing to do. Uh, while if you step on these panels, you tend to actually crack the cells and you start to lose electricity over time. And as the, with the climate change, um, such as hailstorm and hurricanes are becoming more frequent, they're becoming also uh, stronger and therefore their damage to the solar panels are becoming a serious concern. In 2019, tens of a million, millions of dollars of uh, insurance, insurance claim has been made on cracked solar panels because of the hail damage uh, in, in the state of Texas alone. And so this is becoming a serious issue, especially if you wanna maintain or run your solar farm over 20 plus five or 30 plus years to produce electricity. So in addition to the crack, uh, certainly the cracking is, is, is exacerbated by the, uh, the, the climate change um, and some of the uh, pronounced uh, climate change uh, can be felt by hailstorms and hurricanes. 
So here's a movie that I wanted to play. So if you can visualize it, when you load it, that is when someone jumps up and up and down on the on the solar pan, excuse me, uh, PV panel, you can see the cracks forming. And ultimately over time, uh, it leads to power degradation. That is the modules start to produce less electricity, which is bad news. Again, the weather or climate elements introduce the cracks and over time, it, it, those uh, environmental stressors cause cracks in the silicon cells. And that's becoming essentially, it's a very small hairline crack, so you can barely visualize with a naked eye but it's a big problem for the solar industry. And so many of us take our inspiration for engineering solutions from nature. I happen to take it from a childhood TV show, Gumby. So can we possibly make the metallization, those fine grid fingers that I had showed you, that, I, uh, that I've shown you um, in a while, I mean, a couple of slides back, can we make the metallization stretchy? Uh, just like Gumby. And it turns out that we can. Um, so here's a conceptual sort of way to look at it, another way of looking at it. If you magnified a cracked cell and also cracked grid lines, we actually embed these fine conductive needles, make the grid lines stronger, stretchier, and be able to also bridge the gap um, electrically by embedding these conductive needles. So I'm a big fan of um, home and garden channels and PBS, uh, this old house. Oftentimes they will show you these countertops that are putting in into your home. Uh, I guess some of the high-end homes now use these concrete countertops and to make them stronger, uh, people tend to put in these uh, polymer synthetic needles into the concrete to make them stronger. Another example is concrete buildings where you use uh, steel rebar structure to make them stronger. Very same principle. We put in these strong conductive carbon nanotubes into the uh, silver matrix to make them stronger and also stretchier. And um, this is actual image. It's a very uh, fine image. Uh, we, we captured under scanning, what we call scanning electron microscope. Essentially it gives you a magnified view of the cracked silicon grid lines and how these carbon nanotubes are bridging the gap electrically and also mechanically um, conducting electrons essentially along the uh, carbon nanotubes that are exposed in the cracks. So this is a one, just one engineering slide today I wanted to show you. So this graph is a very characteristic, very classical graph that a lot of the material scientists would use but I realize that many in the audience are not necessarily from science or engineering. So Y axis represents the amount of force that you apply to stretch the grid lines. It's the force that you're applying to stretch these fine grid lines. And X axis represents how much you can stretch, how much you can really stretch. And what you're seeing is black line represents the commercial silver paste and compared to what we engineered in the red curve, it shows that you can really stretch this out much farther out, meaning that the composite grid lines becomes um, very stretchy. So imagine under environmental stressors, these cells have to expand and contract, started to form cracks. These stretch metallization will, will, be, will be able to connect these broken cells and maintain the electrical continuity and therefore continue to harness useful electrons from the silicon cells and make the modules last longer. So bottom line, it does give us also economic, provides economic benefits. So here is the graph of how potentially revenue falls over time with high degradation rate for the modules. So cells crack, the modules start to produce less electricity but if you can lower that degradation rate, then this delta represents gray area, represents the additional revenue. Thank you for the one minute warning. And so for a regular about 100 megawatt solar farm, the net present value goes up by about $2.5 million and potentially we can increase the lifetime uh, well over 25 plus, 30 plus years. So 
Of course, the, much of the heavy lifting is done by my students. So I wanted to make sure that they get the credit. And with that, um, I will take questions. Ranger Daniel, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I always, I always. So saying, I don't have a solar farm, but I literally just put solar cells on my house. Yes. How far is this from having an impact on the market at any scale, quite frankly? I mean, are you going into production with this? Yes, um, we are actually trying to find so far from contracts and grants. So from non-dilutive dilutive research funding, we were able to raise about $3.2 million. And now we're trying to scale this up, uh, go, full, go to a full production by essentially doubling um, the size of the company that we started. And so um, hopefully within a year, we'll have, uh, have this uh, product on, on the shelf. That's the goal. So you're saying I shouldn't have bought my cells this year. I should have waited till next, huh? Yes, for a better product. That would have been so much better. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but if, if, if you were to install modules today on your rooftops, I would strongly recommend sun power products. That's, <laughs> they're US made and uh, they use back side metallization that tends to be a little bit more resilient to cell cracks. Didn't know you were gonna get to do a commercial today too. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sang, that was great. Yeah. I thought Crystal would have a question. I don't know. <laughs> He's muted. I mean, I want everybody else to ask questions first. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you now that you're trying to sell your product to us. In reality, it will take a couple of years to actually test it for residential, you know, use, right? I mean, the fact that you may have one or yeah. two cells that work doesn't mean you have the whole panel. Good, good question, um, Christos. We actually have a now a DOE contract to <laughs> test at the module level. So in the next six months, we'll be actually creating or fabricating about 30, close to 40 modules, full-size modules, and then divide them up into two groups, one with the normal metallization and the second group of 20 modules with our metallization. And we'll be doing the, uh, the full stress testing with CFB test lab here in town. And also we'll be doing the field testing at Sandia. So that's, it. that's in, the, in the plan for the next 18 months. Good thing, Mary Jo, you bought now, so. Sorry. There was another, oh, there, okay, oh. Angela, go ahead. I was just gonna read your uh, question, but go ahead. Yeah. Song Angela of Wandinger Nest. Hey, Angela. That was fantastic. Can, you know, there are some solar products they've thought about embedding into pavement. Would this also help with that, with the heat and the cooling? Maybe that could help with the solar products in pavements? Um, so the short answer is yes, there is that potential because obviously um, if you look at the pavement that gets pounded with even more abuse so yes, um, there is that potential. Um, it's interesting that you point that out because now um, lately I'm actually thinking about rather, uh, I've been talking to Mahmoud uh, Taha here in civil engineering and uh, he's thinking about even crack tolerant uh, asphalt for the road construction. And um, as long as you can make these things crack tolerant for longevity, uh, there is certainly that, um, not only for the convenience, but economic benefits to us. Yeah. I'll take one last question from Steffi Weisberg. Hey, Sang. Um, I understand Hello, that the endowment uh, can invest uh, through to some UNM startups through uh, STC. Have you been approached or have you approached them in any way? Um, we, we are very blessed. We haven't had to approach S STC for funding, but um, to increase the cash buffer for the company operation, 
we are fully open to that possibility. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, thanks very much for that presentation. Very interesting. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Uh, our next presenter will be Manuel Montoya, uh, Making Theory a Material Part of Complex Subject Matter, the Terra Prime Learning System. It's green and the mic are yours, Manuel. Thank you. I really appreciate the time. Um, thanks everybody for uh, logging on and uh, sharing some time with me today. I'm going to be loading up the presentation. I'll get started in just a second. Okay, great. Yeah, so a couple of years ago, I had um, what one would call a come to Jesus moment with uh, several of my students. Um, I introduced myself as a thinker who is a little bit country and a little bit rock and roll, meaning I come from the fields of comparative literature and the fields of international relations. And somewhere in the middle of that, I have built a home on the island of Misfit Toys, and I teach globalization uh, using management strategies, uh, international relations theory, and um, theory and cultural practices uh, drawn from the humanities. And inside of that process, I've had the unique opportunity in the School of Management to teach a class on globalization and its relationship to the, the relationship between planetary issues and global markets. And um, student feedback has been pretty good for, uh, for a long time. They love the storytelling in the class, but I'm always interested in learning from the students what, uh, what trips them up. Um, I've often talked about um, globalization as being a problem of the Tesseract. You see the little image of the Tesseract um, doing its work right there in the corner. Um, we live in a world where the more particularistic ways in which we belong to the world uh, dominate our lives. And I always ask students, um, when you introduce yourself and somebody asks you where you're from, the question then becomes, do you use your nationality? Do you say, I'm from Albuquerque? I'm from Mora? I'm from Beijing? Uh, I'm from the United States? I'm from Brazil? And those answers vary from person to person, but nobody ever says we're from planet Earth. And that seems almost like a silly thing to say, but in a lot of ways, students don't have a connection. We don't have a connection to the material depth of belonging to planet Earth. That is normally, you know, given that credit is given to being more particular in the world. And so it's more, it's easier to say I'm a UNM Lobo than to say I'm a planetary citizen. Um, I go back to the theories of Max Weber, who once said that every civil society must bureaucratize itself, that we need material depth in order to understand and then validate our experiences on planet Earth. And that's a social problem that the students represent in the student feedback. You know, some of these students have told me, I love your ideas, but the philosophical stuff is too much. Some things are too abstract in the class. Um, I hope for some more real world examples. Although some will say, I have great stories, please tell me more. And it gives me real world examples. So I had to go back to the drawing board and say, if I'm going to teach international management, and I'm going to talk about how uh, people uh, consume and produce on planet Earth, and what those consumption and production patterns matter for our politics, our society, and for our culture, I then have to think about a material way to connect them to that so that the inside and the outside are matching with each other. So I developed this thing called Terra Prime. Um, it's a, it was inspired by card, tarot cards and Magic the Gathering cards, where I said, I use a lot of theories in there. I use philosophers like Hannah Arendt. I invoke Freud, I invoke Nietzsche, and I invoke all sorts of other types of thinkers that I learned through cultural theory and through uh, cultural studies. Uh, but at the same time, I wanna apply it to management strategies that in their words mean something or are part of the real world to them. And so I had to ask myself, how do we actually create abstract thinking that is considered material or has some sort of material value to it in order for people to talk more in depth and in better layers about planetary issues? So I developed a list of cards. Actually, here's an example of one. It's called Legion. And it's a card of crowds and power. And it actually, it's actually drawn from a bunch of texts that I really like, including Elias Canetti's Crowds and Power. And I asked students, I said, let's just spend a little bit of time talking about populism. And how is it that something for, drawn from popular culture 
um, or the question of populism, how does that work? When you become popular at something, does the value of what you produce change? Uh, if, you're a, if you're an owner of a restaurant and all of a sudden you're more popular, uh, does the quality of your work go down? Uh, do people recognize that? Why is it that Kobe Bryant, after he died in a helicopter accident, uh, was the, the nexus for actually changing helicopter safety, uh, safety laws in California, Oregon, and Washington? Uh, why is it that Kim Kardashian uh, is, uh, is kind of the nexus for talking about prison reform? And we got to talking about those things and students start to realize that there's ways of thinking that actually add material depth to the overall questions that we study. And I said, well, maybe if we develop this as a full deck, a bunch of cards that are drawn from humanistic inquiry from hundreds, maybe even uh, over a thousand years of humanistic inquiry, how do we use those to create a conversation deck? And um, we actually developed this in our class, uh, Planetary Issues and Global Markets, and uh, we turned it into a conversation deck. And instead of talking about issues and then three hours later stroking our beards and saying, that was a really interesting conversation, I have no idea what to do with it, we found a way to layer the conversation in a way that you can deconstruct, you can reverse engineer, you can go back to and you can create a record. Uh, on the right hand side, you see a, 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 an example of how uh, some of the students in our conversations actually then used cards and evoked them and then actually took a little notes and actually helped them with organizing their discussions or research projects uh, with other free flow uh, things that they were doing. Um, the point is the, the card deck was added, um, invented to add layers of depth to global or planetary issues. And here are a list of some of the issues that we've been able to talk about. Uh, we've discussed anything from human trafficking to climate change. Um, during the COVID-19 stay at home order, we actually use several of these cards uh, to talk about important issues. For example, here is the Revenant card. It's called the Creature of Decay. And we just began with a fundamental question. If we're talking about climate change or pollution, why is decay of the flesh a fundamental human fear and how does that connect to that problem that we often talk about that we call pollution or nuclear proliferation? And students start to layer decks. They start to add different dimensions of these questions using these cards. And all of a sudden there's these big picture humanistic cards that start to add a little bit more material depth to each of the discussions that take place. So in spring of 2021, I've worked with a muralist uh, to develop a very postmodern e deck with a notebook and software. And that's actually going to be used to create um, um, the 27 cards that we actually have used. We're going to actually start creating workshops for Sandia Laboratories and other partners um, to start to add a little bit more depth to the way that we talk about global issues. Um, but it's been wildly successful. And now I've seen in feedback that those questions aren't there anymore, that they actually see a connection between the abstract and the real world in a more meaningful way. And so I'm very excited about using this a little bit further and seeing where it can go. Thank you guys. Thanks Manuel, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, what questions, yay, what questions do you have? I'll look in the uh, participants list here. Manuel, I have a question for you. Your thing. Um, since this class, you know, you incorporated abstract thinking into this course, how does it affect your thinking in other courses that are connected to international business or other business topics? It's actually opened up a lot of lines. I actually have two students that developed and uh, are developing thesis level projects as a result of it. Um, um, there's a couple of projects we're using with GEO to actually prepare students for international trips. Um, we have a card called the Kawai card, which is the cute card. And it actually asks questions about why do we replace traumatic events with cute objects. And uh, this was actually intended for a trip that was going to go to Japan and uh, was going to visit the memorial sites of Nagasaki. And uh, there was, there was a lot of discussion about how these, uh, these cards can be used and they're actually good preparatory materials. But I found that in international business that a lot of students now find a way to connect this kind of amorphous concept of a market. Like what is a market? Who are these imaginary groups of people who then buy and consume in certain ways? It's actually been a way for people to understand that those markets are very plastic and they're very, to, 
to, uh, to evoke the last um, presentation, they're very Gumby-like. And in a, in a sense, that kind of nonlinearity is part of the logic of globalization. So you're not gonna be able to enter global markets unless you're actually thinking creatively about the evolving nature of these issues. So it's actually opened up and expanded a ton of opportunities for our students to think about these, these issues. Steffi, go ahead. How, how, what are you doing with climate change in your class? How do you approach it? Is it, is it piecemeal or do you, how does it appear in your class? So we normally have a set of, uh, of discussions. Uh, I'm, I'm currently a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and we've had this platform that we call World 101 where we um, share um, um, expert opinions or we share, uh, we share newsworthy types of um, um, events that are going on. And then once the students have seen that, we all lay the cards out on the table and every student has a turn to be able to lay down one card and then think about that problem using that dimension exclusively. And for example, in our discussions of climate change, one student used the Legion card and actually said like, how is it that Greta Thunberg has become a popular figure? And how does that popularity then disseminate the political will to change issues related to investment, for example, in the Paris Climate Accords, or, you know, uh, another card was about um, the body without organs, which is, a, a, you know, thinking about things that you can see them on the surface, but you don't understand the depth inside of them. And so somebody actually used that and said, we actually don't know. And that's actually part of the, the climate change denier logic, right? And this is, this is how a market is produced for that climate change denial. And so there's all these like little layers that get added over time. And then you go all the way around and you figure out, wow, there's tons of lenses to be able to use or apply to this. And, uh, and students then go away saying, these issues are far more complex than what I initially thought they were. And they actually then appreciate more the expertise that comes to bear on these issues when they do evoke themselves. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you. Very beautiful. Um, I see a, a hand up by Carmen Melendres. Carmen, and then I'll get to you, Billy, next. Thank you, Manuel. That was such an amazing presentation. There seems to be huge potential, um, and I'd love to see more interconnections between your humanistic humanities work with STEM. Uh, there's a movement, uh, Ramiro Jordan, who's and others in engineering focusing on peace engineering, and I, I would love to see the intersectionality of some of your work with uh, the more technical uh, human service aspects that engineering seems to bring. Yeah, I, I, that's that's a great example. I th I'm, I've been in contact with Ramiro about the peace engineering. And in fact, we might be doing a, a session one of these days. One of the ones that I proposed is the false face society card, which is a card that asks the question, when does helping hurt? Mm. And, and when does the word help? When is that a power word that could be replaced by other more deeper ways or complex understandings of I'm not here to help these poor people. I'm here to accompany and to learn in this process. And it's a, a very helpful card. People use that card and it actually becomes a way of just kind of changing the entire tenor of a discussion. So I, I, I'm very excited about making, uh, making sure this system is used in other units on campus and that we have a, a, a dialogue on this. So thank you, Carmen. I would just say the breadth of your knowledge and the brilliance of your thinking and the intersectionality of your thinking, uh, this is some of the most important work I think that's happening at UNM. <laughs> that's very kind of you. Billy Brown. Yeah, uh, thinking about some of the, uh, let's say negative effects of globalization and negative effects of multinational corporations and so on. Uh, how do you tie in uh, the work you do in your class with your students with, with dealing with some of these uh, difficulties uh, that are created by the drive for the drive for power and the drive for domination and the drive for uh, you know the greedy drive for profit. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. You know, um, uh, it, it often troubled me that you know I, I teach a graduate level class on on, on global uh, commerce and business, and we don't normally evoke the word neoliberalism. But the the the, the problem with globalization is that. It often, it often can get segregated very quickly into um, you're one of these hippies that just wants to save the planet and then you're one of these neoliberalist crazies that doesn't care about human beings. What these questions do is they ask these higher order questions that get at those things and you then develop the vocabulary over uh, in, in a different stage. So for example, I have the car, a card called the first human power, which asks, 
you know, isn't the first human power the ability to name things? And it actually goes back to like these old Edenic kind of mythologies and whatnot. And then from there say, well, isn't naming a designation of value? And then from there say, what are the power dynamics in being able to say, you know, that, that, that uh, plot of land over there with that water is going to be worth these number of acre feet. And how many people are going to respond to that as either a profanity or as a sacred thing? And so all of a sudden, you just have that one dimension. You start playing out these questions that play out in perspectives that eventually either polarize or, or, or distribute globalization as a very dangerous predatory thing, or on the other hand, the creation of community, transnational networks and communities. So it, it, it addresses those issues, Billy, but at the same time, it also does it in a way that also gets the person to leave home bothered by the question so that they then explore how these things actually have nuance and depth rather than just kind of these consolidated sides from one to the other. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Manuel. That's very interesting. Really appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Um, uh, let's see, we'll hear next from Amy Neal, who's uh, a professor in speech and hearing sciences. Her talk is uh, speech biomarkers of repeated head injuries in professional fighters. So Amy, the mic and the screen are yours. And you are muted. There Thanks we go. so much for, for having me here today and for reminding me to turn on my microphone. Nothing worse than a speech pathologist that you can't hear. Um, today, uh, and I also hadn't realized that all the presenters were going to include toys in their presentations, and I'm kicking myself for not having a picture of Rock'em Sock'em robots for this talk. So today I'm going to talk about our search for speech characteristics that will allow us to identify neurologic damage in people who receive repeated blows to the head, uh, professional boxers and mixed martial artists. And I'd like to thank um, first my colleague, Jessica Richardson, for bringing this project to our department. Uh, I wanna thank my master's student, Sophia Kay, who did much of the work for this presentation for her master's thesis. Definitely wanna thank our, uh, thank our collaborators who run the Professional Fighters Brain Health Study in Las Vegas, Nevada. And of course, the Women in STEM Award at UNM for funding our project. So uh, newsflash, repeated blows to the head are probably not good for your brain. And on the right-hand side here, you see an image of a brain of, of someone who has advanced chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is a progressive degenerative disease associated with repeated head trauma. And symptoms of CTE usually appear years after the onset of head impacts. Currently, CTE can only be diagnosed on autopsy. So many researchers are um, searching for biomarkers to diagnose it in living patients relatively early in the course of the disorder. And it turns out that speech is a great candidate for a biomarker. It requires the contributions of many parts of the nervous system to coordinate dozens of muscles for the production of precise rapid movements of speech, and it's really easy to collect from people. So the effects of repeated head injury in boxers have been known for decades. And in fact, in 1928, Martland described the punch drunk sy syndrome in boxers. And fighters with this degenerative condition experience um, a number of uh, difficulties. They experience behavioral disturbances and cognitive dysfunction but the effects that I'm interested in are the movement disturbances. And in particular, dysarthria is the term for abnormal speech that results from neurologic damage. And one of the patterns associated with boxing is Parkinsonism uh, and associated with repeated head injury in boxing is Parkinsonism, which is a set of movement abnormalities, including tremor, slow movements of body parts, muscle rigidity and difficulty speaking clearly. And Parkinsonism results from damage to the basal ganglia, structures that are located deep inside the brain and that can be impacted in boxing. And here I'm showing pictures of Muhammad Ali, um, probably the most famous former boxer who has or had Parkinsonism. And on the left hand side, you can see his expressionless face. That's another symptom of Parkinsonism. 
And Visar Barisha and his colleagues at Arizona State University analyzed speech samples produced by Muhammad Ali over several decades. And in this graph here, you can see how his rate of speech uh, shown uh, in here and the number of syllables per second declined from 1968 up to 1981 as his neurologic condition progressed. So in our study, we analyzed samples from um, people who participate in the Professional Fighters Brain Health Study. And we had 62 boxers and 40 mixed martial artists. And we also included 27 um, males with no history of repeated head injury. And we're gonna call those healthy controls. And all of them read aloud a standard passage consisting of several sentences that started out, the rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. And we used transcription software um, and acoustic analysis software to analyze several aspects of speech that are often disturbed in neurologic disorders. So we measured their speech rate, the number of syllables produced per second. We measured the number of pauses that they produced at grammatical locations. So in other words, typically at commas or periods in the passage read aloud. We analyzed the number of pauses produced at atypical locations, so pauses that occurred within phrases, not at grammatic junctures. And we also looked at the number of disfluencies in their speech. So things like di 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 disfluency or insertion of additional words like um, uh, hesitations like that. And let me play you a sample of um, one of the boxers from our um, Rainbow passage. The sunlight shines rain drops up in there. They act like a prism and they form a rain, form of rainbow. The rainbow is a vision of white light to many beautiful colors. And I'm imagining that you all had some difficulty understanding what he was saying and that you noticed a variety of difficulties that he had with his speech, including um, his voice quality was poor. His um, consonants were not, not precisely articulated and he produced some disfluencies and pauses that were um, not typical. Right. And so here's our results. We found that both boxers and mixed martial artists spoke more slowly on average than healthy controls. Um, and I'm showing here the uh, controls are always in blue. The boxers are in deep red and the mixed martial artists are in a light red color. And here I'm showing the number of syllables per second. And you can see that the control subjects produce more syllables per second than either group of professional fighters. And there was a difference of about a half syllable at least per second, which is actually pretty substantial. We found that the boxers paused more at grammatical locations um, than the healthy controls did. And this could be a sign of neurologic impairment Typical speakers produce uh, very long phrases while reading aloud, but people with neurologic disorders may only be able to produce relatively short phrases before they have to regroup and take another breath. And we also found that boxers had um, more disruptions in their speech. So they produced more pauses in agrammatical locations within phrases, and they produced um, more disfluencies. And you can see that um, boxers in particular had a lot of disfluencies or atypical pauses compared to the other two groups. And these probably are signs of neurologic disturbance um, because these atypical pauses and disfluencies are very unusual in typical speakers. We just don't hear those in um, people who have uh, healthy brains. So in summer, we did see that boxers were a bit worse than the mixed martial artists um, in our speech measures. And this might relate to differences in the two fighting styles because there are more hits to the head in boxing. Um, and some of our uh, professional brain health study colleagues recently reported that uh, mixed martial artists had larger brain volumes. That is, they expect, experienced less atrophy or um, disappearance of brain tissue than boxers. And they also received higher cognitive scores um, than boxers did. So our results show that speech tasks are sensitive to repeated head injury in fighters. We're going to explore other acoustic measures of speech behavior, and we're performing studies where listeners rate the intelligibility, um, voice quality, 
articulatory precision and fluency of speech to better understand the speech deficit profile associated with repeated head injury in fighters. We're trying to get recordings of speech tasks that are even more sensitive to head injury called diatocokinetic rate tasks, where the participant has to repeat syllables as fast as possible. So they have to say things like ta 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 or padika 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 padika. Those are really, really sensitive to neurologic disturbance. And um, my colleague Jessica Richardson is looking at language measures in narrative discourses produced by these fighters. And we hope to use these speech and language tasks to identify neurologic dysfunction early and to prevent additional decline in people who experience repeated head injury. Great, thanks very much. Um, Mary Jo is first in line again with a question. <laughs> Mary Jo, go ahead. Thanks, that was really interesting. Um, so if it's diagnosed early through looking at speech, is, is there treatment or is it just basically, okay, you need to stop now? Uh, yeah, it's, um, the, the tricky part is, is that um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy or whatever this disorder is that's occurring um, as a result of repeated head injury um, generally occurs many years after they stop boxing. Um, and so it would be really nice if we had a task that showed, uh, oh, look, you've just experienced some brain damage while you're fighting, you need to stop now. It's possible that speech could serve that function. So um, in the study I talked about by Barisha and his colleagues with Muhammad Ali, they did note that his speech rate declined immediately after a fight and then um, went back closer to normal um, several days or weeks after a fight. So it would be nice to have a way to tell people don't box anymore, like that should make sense, right? Um, but, um, and, and to answer the other part of your question, there's not necessarily a treatment for this other than don't get hit in the head anymore right now. I think too, if I can add to Amy really quickly, um, one of the things that we do with progressive disease, this is Jessica, by the way, um, is, um, you know, as soon as we do notice a decline, as soon as we do get that diagnosis, there are a couple of courses. And one is that you work really hard to preserve whatever it is that they have left at that point in time. Um, so you begin, you know, pretty aggressive rehab in ideal situations uh, to make sure that you slow down that progression or that you help to maintain. Um, and then that's the focus, you know, too, of course, of uh, various treatments that are being developed for um, dementias and, um, you know, for other degenerative disorders um, and to start to actually focus on, on this population as well with those uh, pharmacological treatments, those non-invasive brain stimulation treatments um, and, and the like. Thank you. I see a question by Song that says, um, are there thresholds yeah. for these kinds of behaviors? Um, it turns out that we do have some normative data for those diatocokinetic rate tasks I talked about. So things like ta 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 ta. We do have norms for how many how many syllables per second uh, normal speakers can produce, um, but there's a lot of variation um, across speakers, and um, sometimes it's really difficult to get even typical speakers to produce these um, maximal tasks as fast as they can. So the answer is, there's not a threshold, but we do have some normative data. <clears throat> Christos had a question, Christos. Yes, uh, I don't know the sample of fighters that you used in your studies, but also today, at least for Olympic competition, et cetera, they put headgear to absorb some, I'm assuming, of the punches. Uh, had you studied that sample? Right now, we're only looking at professional fighters. That's what's in the database um, that we're working with. And there have actually been a lot of changes in boxing over the years. Um, and so there is some more protection. Um, and so you don't see a lot of the real old style punch drunk or dementia pugilistica that you would have seen decades ago. Um, and it turns out that um, mixed martial artists uh, tend to experience fewer knockouts and technical knockouts than boxers. So there are some differences in fighting style, um, but still um, getting the hit, getting hit on the head, whether you wear a helmet or a padded um, headgear or not, 
is still pretty damaging. And so um, there's a lot in the news these days about CTE in professional football players, right? They wear helmets, they're looking, you know, they're desperately looking for padding that will be more protective for these players. But, you know, getting hit in the head causes things internally to happen. Your brain sloshes around in your skull and gets um, damaged in a lot of different parts of the brain that a helmet, the currently available helmets just can't protect you from. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Amy, thanks very much. It's a very interesting presentation. Um, and I suspect in the long run, it's gonna help a lot of people. Um, okay, our final presentation is by uh, Professor Mosami Roy from uh, Physics and Astronomy, uh, presenting MAGMA, its role in generation and destruction of continents. So, Professor Roy. Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> um, thank you for uh, coming and attending and um, thanks to all the speakers for really interesting talks. Um, I am sorry to say that this is my first time attending Lightning Lounge, but it won't be my last. This is really fun. Um, so, I'm going to talk about um, magma and its role in the, the evolution of continents and what we know as continental lithosphere. Um, first, before I start, are you able to see my screen? Okay. Um, yes, looks good. Are you, okay, great. So if I sh uh, start with play mode, okay. So, um, this is my group. It, it's changed a bit since this picture was taken last fall, but I wanted to acknowledge the undergraduates and graduate students that have worked with me on what I'm going to show you today. And also the funding sources come from a slew of places, but in particular, I wanted to thank UNM SRAC and also the Women in Science, um, Women in STEM Award from the UNM Advance. Um, so, as you might imagine, right, looking at the topography or bathymetry, this is sort of the shape of the earth, um, you see that the outer surface is, has these continental regions and the oceanic regions. And whoops, um, this difference is essentially driven by volcanic and magmatic activity. So it's molten rocks cooling and that makes continental crust and also oceanic crust. And that the, the difference between them ultimately is due to it, their chemistry, the difference in chemistry and density. But magmatism is a word that I'll use now. Magmatism basically is very important for the earth. And so um, moving on, you may have heard in plate tectonics of something called a subduction zone where one plate sinks down beneath another and um, this generates what's called a volcanic arc. And um, this is where molten material essentially makes it to the surface through what's called stratovolcanoes or uh, cone volcanoes. And continents are built from amalgamations of these arcs. So the work I'm gonna show you basically uh, looks at the effects of magma as it moves through continents. So at a very basic level, um, we started off, we have a part of our group that looks at using both cosmic ray muons, which are coming to us um, essentially uniformly uh, at the surface of the earth. And we look at imaging volcanoes. This is the topography of a volcano that's been kind of discretized, and we're imaging it um, by putting detectors, muon detectors, that kind of look at muons coming through the rock to the detector that gives you an idea of the density of the rock. So that allows you to image, essentially the goal is to image the motion of magma within the volcanic plumbing system. And this has been done with using both muons and gravity data. So another branch of what we do, this, is, this has been a really fun project, um, is you know, we just sort of sat back and said, well, volcanoes, you know, if you ask a child to draw a volcano, they'll draw this beautiful conical shape. And like children from the 1700s or so, we've all been staring at these beautiful ideal forms. 
This is the woodcut from Hiroshige, um, in, the Japanese artist, but also Hokusai, you may know. And so we wanted to ask, okay, where does this shape come from? Um, at, a, at a basic level, it's maybe due to stuff piling and flowing down the side of a volcano, maybe ash flow, maybe lava flow. And so we looked at um, volcanoes from all around the globe. Um, it's hard to see, I apologize, but you can kind of see in the map, the, the dots representing um, volcanoes that we've studied. And then we looked at their iso these isolated volcanoes and studied their shape. And for the most part, many isolated volcanoes actually follow this beautiful conical form, which I'll come back to. Um, but one student of mine, Kat Cosburn, has been working on what does it mean when a volcano departs from this conical ideal form? So she's been looking at, you know, are there, uh, these are cross sections and, and um, I seem to have lost my mouse. So, but basically we're thinking of the volcano, the shape of the volcano as a sum of external contributions and internal contributions. The external ones being due to lava flows and um, that's what gives rise to this conical form. But then the internal ones might be due to magma filled cracks. And down in the bottom right is a, one such ensemble of magma filled cracks that can lead to um, a non sort of um, either a non axisymmetric form or a non ideal but axisymmetric form. So this is work that she's just submitted and it, it's been really fun because it asks a very fundamental question about, you know, what, why the shape of these um, conical volcanoes. Um, of course, we're ignoring erosion and more complicated things like that, and one would need to include those down the line. So that's our plan. Um, and then finally, we, with, a, with an undergrad this summer, we've been looking at, okay, so when you do have um, piles of, say, lava flows or what are called, you know, ash flows or pyroclastic flows, um, why does that lead to this conical form? Where does this come from? So this is work that we've been doing and we've been trying to treat this um, problem by thinking of each individual flow in the cartoon on the top left as you know, a pile of flows, maybe each color is a different kind of flow or in the bottom is an actual simulation of different flows that all start at the central axis and then they fall down the side of the volcano. And each of these flows is treated as what's called a Bingham fluid. Um, and that's like toothpaste. It basically is a fluid that flows um, when you squeeze it you know, very slowly, but otherwise it can hold its solid shape. It, it leads to what's called a yield stress dependent um, flow thickness. And so that's what we've been working on. Um, in the second part of our, our sort of volcano related project. And then finally at the, at the very uh, sort of the last thing I wanted to show you is the really big picture of what happens on the whole continent scale. So this, of course, you know, the other two that, things that I showed you, the volcano shape, the volcano form, uh, volcano monitoring with muons, they might have some hazard connection. So it's useful to society. I will tell you that other than pure um, sort of scientific pleasure of finding out things, um, this has no economic value. So, but anyway, here is a picture of the Western US and each dot is um, a location where you've had volcanic rocks reach the surface um, and cool at the surface. And so I'm playing this movie and the numbers here are millions of years in time. So it's coming from 65 million years ago to the present. And there's a lot of interesting patterns that come around when you look at a, an animation like this. And we've sat and stared at this, but the main thing I wanted to tell you is that we've been thinking a lot about when you have um, a lithospheric plate, that's basically the plate of plate tectonics, and you have magma going through it, how do we understand the changes that happen inside that plate as a result of that magma motion? So 
that's the last project that I'll talk about. But um, we've been arguing uh, with some students. In fact, um, this work, this, this picture is from work by three separate senior honors theses by undergraduates um, who've all now finished, but um, this paper was a really fun paper um, to, to do with undergraduate students. But anyway, we, we basically argued that this pattern of magmatic um, infiltration, magma rising through the plate and interacting with North America has the particular spatial distribution it does because of the way North America is moving on top of the mantle beneath. And so I won't go into details, but that raises the question of, you know, what does magma going through a plate do to the plate? Can it fundamentally change the plate? And that's where we're heading now. Um, so staying with North America, I just wanted to show you that, you know, over the last 65 million years, the Cenozoic uh, time period, we've had all this magmatic activity happen in North, North America. Um, you can see the dots in this picture that show you where we see volcanic rocks at the surface today. Um, ignore the colors for now, but um, basically what we're trying to do uh, at the moment is think about quantifying how magma moving through a plate can actually modify it, can actually change its behavior, can change its physical properties, its chemical properties. And that's something that hasn't really been done in a quantitative way. So in this manner, we're kind of coming into new territory, but the idea is that you have a system where maybe the continent, the continental plate, uh, and, and since I've lost my mouse, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this um, mouse over here. Somehow when I put it on a uh, slideshow, I lose the mouse. But anyway, you have this gray bit, which is a cartoon of the continental plate, and you have pulses of magma that go through it. So in North America, here's a little cartoon. We had, it was a subduction zone for a very, very long time on its Western boundary. That subduction zone would have introduced some degree of fluids to the bottom of the plate. We think the fluids changed the chemistry of the plate in the sense that it um, hydrated some of the minerals inside the plate. So that's schematically shown here in the blue. Once the subduction stops and the, the sunken plate beneath North America is removed, you basically have the opportunity to bring hot material from beneath in contact with this hydrated North American. The base of North America is hydrated. So this plate then we feel would um, end up melting and generating a lot of melt um, and interacting with upward uh, generated melts from beneath as well. So there's cryptic evidence that in fact um, this process has completely transformed the bottom of North America, the, the plate of North America. And that evidence comes in mostly from the geochemistry of the rocks that make it to the surface. So I have some colleagues at CU Boulder with whom I'm collaborating on it, but we're trying to quantify the time scale over which magma infiltrating into a plate would destroy the bottom of the plate, or if and, and when it would destroy the bottom of the plate, um, would maybe remobilize it and make it flow and not be stiff and strong like the rest of the plate, et cetera. So our preliminary results essentially show that you can get a zone of what I call, it's called TRZ here, but it's basically what should be thought of as a thermal reworking zone at the bottom of the plate that is um, a region where melt infiltration has um, thinned the plate or changed its chemistry and its temperature. And we think, and this is the last thing I'll show, I, uh, that we think we have some evidence for this um, from the chemistry of the basalts. My colleagues specifically look at the ratio, this thing called the 
tantalum thorium ratio. It sounds very obscure, but um, in some sense, it's a very interesting marker because this is a plot of the tantalum thorium ratio as a function of age. Um, and I'm sorry that it's a little fuzzy, but basic, each of these color coded dots comes from different boxes within the Western US. And what's very common to each of these boxes is that there seems to be a transition from low tantalum thorium ratios to high tantalum thorium ratios. And this transition for various reasons, my colleagues um, have argued that it's related to the degradation of the base of the plate. And this is really exciting because this is the first time that we can use chemical data to set a time scale. Um, this gives us a time scale for the change uh, that this plate has undergone. And so this time scale is long in some places and it's short in some other places. On average, it's on the order of many tens of millions of years. So it's very long on the human time scale. But it's it's exciting for us because, you know, in my group, we like to use physics and math to understand earth processes. And anytime data helps us quantify things like spatial scales and temporal scales, it's a very exciting thing. So one day this will help us understand the evolution of continents, um, maybe in general, not only in North America. Thank you very much. That's, that's fascinating work. Um, what, what questions do our audience members have? I see a uh, hand up by Maya, Maya Elric. Hi, Masumi, thank you very much. So to make it to help me understand this, could I basically say that added volcanism weakens the plate? Not always. And that's the tricky part. So we think that in the Western US, there are places where this has happened. But, you know, when you go to the textbook example of a subduction zone, it is true that a volcanic arc is generally a weak spot in a plate. But having a volcanic arc doesn't destroy a plate. So there are certain times in which adding magma to a plate ends up destroying it. And we think that what is needed is some kind of preconditioning. And that preconditioning is related to that hydration that I mentioned. Um, having water and other fluids precondition the bottom of the plate helps this process of um, essentially breakdown of the plate. And the last thing I didn't really mention, this is work that we're doing with um, myself, Megan Lentz, a grad student, and this uh, a person who's an expert in reactive transport modeling at Los Alamos. Um, so we're trying to actually quantify this in, in models, but it's early days still. Thank you. So there was a question in the, in the chat from Sang Han. Sang, are you still with us? Could you just um, say this? Because yeah, I probably so, can't. So, I, I, okay. I will demonstrate speech flaws if I try to read this. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the great talk, illuminating, I, I should say. Um, I'm just curious, I, you, you know, being on plastic uh, can include toothpaste, mayonnaise, et cetera. I was wondering whether you could use the dynamic similarity where you keep some of the uh, non-dimensional numbers the same, whether it be Reynolds number or Froud number, and actually being able to simulate how the shape evolves over time um, using model uh, systems rather than working with uh, these real systems that literally move at a glacial pace. Yes. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So this is work that's just getting started, but already I'll, when we started this, um, I'll show you. So one can actually come up with a very simple minded first approach um, where like, you know, a Bingham fluid, we have a yield stress, but in a real lava, flow, there's, there's a lot of literature in, and work that's been done um, in the geology community on the rheology of lava flow. So we do know quite a bit about um, 
sort of how the yield stress depends on flow length, for instance. It's a, it's a cooling mush. It can be a crystal mush. It can have bubbles. It can have, um, you know, it can be a turbulent gas cloud of, of um, cooling bits of rock fragments as well. So um, we haven't included any of that complexity. So we have abstracted this in the sense that essentially we have two scaling parameters, one that controls how the, the thickness of the flow scales with its length. So how far down the edifice the flow goes. And then the other parameter is how the thickness of the flow scales with the local slope that it's flowing over. So that's a little bit like this. This is a this is a very simple-minded thing, but this is flow thickness. And it, roughly speaking, for a certain range of slopes, it it scales as one over the slope or one over sine of the slope angle. So yeah, we have been playing with these scaling parameters, and our goal is to try to understand um, how it is that this pattern this conical shape arises in so many isolated stratocones, stratovolcanoes. They're all at different sort of evolutionary stages of their formation. Um, so in this work that Kat Cosburn did, we have volcanoes, some 200 of them. In fact, I'm only showing three, but as long as the ellipticity, the basal ellipticity of the volcano is rather low, meaning it's rather circular in its base, it looks like a very simple analytic form seems to fit the shape of this volcano. So um, there are departures, which are very interesting, but there is this universality that we're trying to go after. Sorry, can I ask you a, a slightly different question, which is, it seems that you've, you've worked a great deal with with undergraduates, uh, yeah. which is amazing and great. And I'm just wondering if there are any, any sort of tips, tips for others about you know, getting undergraduates to do this kind of sustained, very complex and, and, and very advanced research at that stage in their training. Um, so I've been really fortunate that uh, to be able to find some of these students. Um, I, I think the main thing is that um, at least in places like physics, where you know often we label our undergraduate students by how talented, quote unquote, they are, um, but ultimately how well they do in their classes depends not so much on real measures of talent, but rather on preparation. So. When you're trying to do quantitative work, yes, it helps to have good preparation, undergrads with good preparation. When you don't have undergrads with good preparation, it's a longer road, but it's really fulfilling. Um, I have to say that that's what I've learned is that you know some of the students that I've worked with have done really well in the research settings, but not so well in their classes. Um, though for the most part, they've all done, they've come with really good preparation. So I, I struggle with that. Um, you know, I think I've been very fortunate, but our challenge, especially in STEM, is to get away from labeling, especially undergraduate students, as, you know, someone who's really talented and will succeed in physics versus someone who won't, because we really don't know that when you have when you're throwing people with very different levels of preparation into a freshman physics class. That's, that's what I'm learning. Um, and I don't know a good answer for the way around it. But, you know, I think when students realize that um, this person that I'm working with doesn't care so much about um, how I do on my tests, but rather is trying to get me to think, I think that helps a little bit. And that certainly lines up really well with, with what the Center for Teaching and Learning is trying to promote you know, across the curriculum in terms of thinking, in terms of growth mindsets in working with students um, and engaging undergraduates in research. So um, I'm very excited to hear about this. 
Well, I think we're a little over our time. I want to thank all four of our presenters. Those were as, as, very interesting talks. Um, and, and there have been a great bunch of comments on the chat room of pe people who had to peel off, uh, but we're thanking uh, all the presenters. So um, our next uh, our next Lightning Lounge is on November 11th. Uh, I hope I will see you all again then. Thanks for coming. Thank you.